Hi, everyone. For those of you just now joining us, welcome to the Radical, Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Quadratic Voting in Action, moderated by Paula Berman. I'll now hand it over to Paula to introduce herself and our panel participants. Over to you, Paula. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning with us to talk about quadratic voting. I'm very excited about this panel. And one of the reasons is that we've been hearing about how it's difficult to have positive narratives around technology. So this is a panel where we're going to have very interesting, good, positive stories on the use of quadratic voting. From each of us here, we have implemented this in very different contexts in different countries and for different purposes. So my name is Paula Berman and I'm from Brazil and with Democracy Earth and Radical Exchange we have implemented quadratic voting for the legislature of the state of Colorado. Ben who's also with us here, he is the director of operations for governor police from the state of Colorado, and they will be implementing this soon on the executive branch. Ruth and Sarah are here from London and Berlin, and they are going to be talking about their quadratic voting pilots with Further Field, who, which is the longest the center for arts and technology from London. And Max is here from Berlin and is He's going to be talking about his pilot with Diora.Earth, uh, which implemented quadratic voting with the vote party in Germany. So great diversity and variety of stories that I'm excited to share. Um, and I'm also, before we get into this, I'll be giving a small introduction and explanation of how quadratic voting works. Last year, I was talking to Jennifer, the CEO of Radical Exchange, and I said to her that every time that I hear about quadratic voting, I feel like an explanation of how the mechanism works is should be mandatory because otherwise you hear about how it helps reduce extremism or polarization or how it tackles the tyranny of the majority. And all of this can sound a bit vague. And if you don't understand how it actually works, and how this happens, you can be even a little skeptical. So hopefully uh, with the aim of preventing that from happening, I'll just give a short explanation and then we'll be hearing those stories. And in the end, we're going to have a question and answer session. So feel free to start sending your questions and we'll get to them towards the end. Okay, so quadratic voting was created as an alternative to a one person, one vote system, which is what we usually think about when we think of voting, which is that each person has one vote. So let's say you have options A, B, C, and D, and you get to pick one of them. But one of the limitations of this system is that um, what if you as a voter uh, picked option A, but you're also supportive of options C and D? Then one person, one vote system doesn't let you provide that very important information. So one of the first things that quadratic voting does is that it expands the scope of information that you're able to provide for uh, the voting system. So this is done via uh, having a sort of uh, a system of credits that you can distribute around the options and express the intensity of your preferences for each of them. But the trick with quadratic voting is that it goes even further and kind of sharpens that signal. And the way that it does that is by making the price for your votes grow exponentially. So at a quadratic rate. So you have everyone gets a set number of credits, everyone gets the same amount. So it's fair in that sense, even though there are different implementations of this uh, being explored, but in principle, everyone gets the same amount. And then for every additional vote that you cast in one option, the price grows at a quadratic rate. So one vote is going to cost one credit, two votes cost four, three costs nine, four costs 16, and so forth. 
So you can see that this kind of quickly adds up, it grows exponentially, and it's going to make very strong preferences very expensive. So it kind of works as a decision-making hack where you have to, you have this limited budget and you have to make trade-offs in your preferences and really decide how, what your priorities are as you are allocating your votes. And it's very effective in doing that. And people who have tried it and myself included, and I highly strongly recommend everyone to try this out. Once you do it, you come out of it with a sense that you have really expressed yourself, which is by no means a small thing, right? When we usually feel so um, underrepresented by, by our institutions and we feel like it's very hard for them to capture uh, our desires. So that's a really interesting uh, aspect. And then another aspect which is important to mention in regards to quadratic voting, and I won't exhaust everything, but hopefully we will be talking about uh, many of them in this conversation. But another one is that it helps um, with the issue of the tyranny of the majority, which is that in one person, one vote systems, the majority always wins. And there isn't really a way for minorities to make their voices heard which is very problematic. So quadratic voting helps in the sense that if one person is going to allocate say 10 votes for one issue, that's going to cost them a hundred credits, right? 10 squared is a hundred. But if 10 different people organize themselves and decide to each put one vote for an option, then they're going to also get 10 votes there but that's going to cost in aggregate only 10 votes. So 10 votes by one person cost 100 credits versus 10 votes for 10 people cost only 10 credits. So you can see that in this way, quadratic voting is kind of empowering groups to organize and make their voices heard. It's giving them uh, more political clout. So this is a very interesting property. Quadratic voting is here to help us uh, see our priorities, navigate our differences. It helps, it signals very accurately whether the strong preferences of the minority outweigh the weak preferences of the majority. And uh, it has a lot of potential, especially if you think about how blockchain technology is also developing and these networks also have a need for governance. So it's very promising in that sense. There are some limitations uh, which are important to mention. One of them is that you always need a very strong, very secure method for authenticating membership. So if you can create fake identities, then you break the entire logic of the system. So this means that there are some limitations to where this can be applied today. So hopefully we can have a very realistic also in down to earth conversation about uh, where this makes sense and where this doesn't make sense. And also how it can help in you know, these political times where there's so much change going on. Okay, so um, introducing our, our panelists and uh, thinking about some of the different applications of this, I would like to uh, start with Ruth and Sarah who have been testing quadratic voting in the context of arts commissioning and with local communities. And they have also been researching something that I think is of the utmost importance, which is how to make quadratic voting fun and engaging, uh, which is by no means a small task. So Ruth and Sarah, um, please tell us how this is being received by this community and in the context of arts and culture. So, okay, Sarah's I'm in doing the slides, slides, but hopefully you can see them all. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Paula, thank you so much for such a brilliant and explicatory uh, introduction to quadratic voting. I don't think I've ever heard it done so well, and it makes our job now much easier. So thank you very much, and it's really exciting to be here. Um, so Sarah and I are here to talk about culture stake and but before we do that it feels important to talk a little bit about where this project's come from 
So uh, I'm the artistic director of an organization called Furtherfield, which grew up with the web. So we're an arts, technology and social change organization who has always worked with artists, techies and activists who are interested in how networked media and global digital media changes the way power is done, uh, the way we relate to each other. So how social relations operate. And we're a network of people who have been thinking about expressivity and collaboration across networks really since the mid 90s. Um, this photo is a photo taken from our gallery. So we host a small public gallery in the heart of uh, Finsbury Park in North London. Uh, in this park, 180 different languages are spoken by uh, the people who live around the park who comprise can very diverse different kinds of communities, including large migrant communities, which are pretty typical of North London. Um, so our focus is on playful, translocal co-creation. So how the world is different because of hyper-connectivity and uh, high levels of migration. We work with artists who engage with urgent debates of our time, and we work with uh, free open source software and commons philosophy. So really always thinking about how uh, new knowledge wants to be free and wants to promote freedom and free use of the knowledge that we all create together. Um, Sarah, you should say something about yourself. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this, you've heard from Bruce. Um, I am, my name is Sarah. I'm an artist and software developer. Um, I don't actually work at Furtherfield, but I've worked with Furtherfield in a couple different capacities for several years now. Um, and I've been working in the blockchain industry also since 2015, 2016. Um, so I'm working with Furtherfield now to develop Culture Stake, the project we're talking about today. Okay, next slide, please. So we're here to talk about Culture Stakes. So Culture Stakes is a web-based voting and connection system for decentralized cultural decision making and investment. So it enables quadratic voting on the blockchain via a playful front-end interface that allows everyone to vote on the types of cultural activity that they would like to see in their locality. And it speaks to kind of two core problems. Uh, one is the problem of with cultural funding actually it's it's part of a wider deeper and very harsh problem which is uh, the wider art world problem and problems of inequity in the art world in general uh, and the second problem is uh, the question of democracy and we learned uh, the hard way about some of the problems that we have with democratic systems in the contemporary uh, yeah in contemporary society so the problem with cultural funding is that we have a kind of celebrity a celebrity art world which is very pyramidical that garners great wealth whilst most artists and even the wealthiest cities struggle to survive um, this results in major artists and cultural sponsors having the upper hand and can result in a kind of winner takes all for artists and a one size fits all blockbuster approach to programming. Um, and the problem and, and the third problem is that people in places have very little say about the decisions on the arts that happens in the places where they live and that they care about. Um, so this results in a disconnect between audiences, artists and venues and a feeling that like politics, art is the preserve of a tiny elite of people and it really isn't their business what gets made and who decides. So that's the cultural funding problem. Um, what did Brexit teach us? So you, in the UK, Brexit taught us that the whole kind of ecology of systems for a fair democratic process are really corrupted and broken. And this is a whole set of problems uh, that include a kind of asymmetry of ability to influence voters, like if you think about Cambridge um, Analytica and Facebook scandal, uh, profit driven media and covert political funding by foreign interests and financial speculators. So there's a whole set of things, but most 
uh, appropriate to this setting is that it demonstrated the failure of the one person, one vote system to deliver a result that the population or its government could understand or act on. So Paula was talking about the tyranny of the majority. In the case of Brexit, 51% voted to leave the EU with a 3% margin. So this is a tiny minority voting on something with huge impact. Uh, and there's no way for us to know why people voted the way they did uh, or how strongly the various issues matter to them. And as a result, the significance of referenda results are catastrophically open to interpretation and manipulation by authorities. So Culture Stake is an artistic cultural respond, response to these two sets of problems. And it's about engaging a really wide diversity of people to think it's their business to try and make this kind of deal with these situations. And now Sarah will show you how the app is approaching this. So here are some screenshots from Culture Stake. It's an app that will work on, uh, it's a browser-based app that will work on desktop and mobile. Um, attendees to arts fairs and festivals um, can participate in activities uh, vote on which activities they enjoyed and would like to see more of in the place that they are in, um, and to give feedback about what they found meaningful about the activities they enjoyed. Um, how it works is when people attend a festival, they get a map. This is not a map drawn by our fantastic design team. It is a map drawn by me, so it may not look like this. Um, but they get one, it's printed out. Um, and as they participate in various artworks or events at the festival, um, they collect stickers, um, which they can put on the map. We kind of playfully call this proof of presence. Um, and this is what Culture Stake uses to um, validate that people actually saw the activities that they're voting on. Um, once someone has sort of passed through um, several activities, they arrive at the decision den, which is a sort of voting tent like physical space set up at the fair. Um, and they can go to a voting booth where, if I can change to my next slide, they can scan the stickers that represent the activities that they saw, um, and then they can vote on them. Um, so the voting interface itself, um, as I guess, most of our, my fellow panelists have confronted um, and Paula uh, got into as well, the difficulty of explaining quadratic voting. Um, this is a, a mock-up of the interface that they see. Um, as you all probably know, there are three parameters really um, that need to be communicated to a user or a voter. Um, and we've borrowed from heads up displays in games and social media filters to try to make this both understandable and fun. Um, so one parameter is the amount of votes unspent still or remaining. Um, so that's this sort of health bar along the bottom. Um, and then there are sliders uh, that, you know, this little um, character can be dragged across to represent the amount of votes being spent um, on any given artwork. Um, and then to communicate the vote efficacy or um, the, the, the power of votes towards any item, the square root of the amount of votes, um, we use this little character called the Snuggle Punk. Um, and he has 12 different states of happiness, um, from really pretty unhappy to ecstatic hard eyes. Um, and, and Ruth, what, what, how do we explain the Snuggle Punk? He's a, a, an outspoken um, political is character. It, so, so the Snuggle Punk is politically outspoken, but warm and compassionate. Exactly. So he's, he's quite cuddly, um, but expressive. Uh, so as uh, someone is voting, um, they, they drag maybe the first slider across, um, and in this uh, image, a third of the votes have been spent. Um, but you'll see that the snuggle punk, we've, we're actually on the seventh happiest snuggle punk already. Um, so his happiness is changing quadratically as votes are spent. Um, so someone may continue voting, and we see in the bottom one is not that many votes have been spent, um, but we're already on the fifth or sixth happiest snuggle punk. Um, and in the bottom, we've dragged almost all the way across, 
um, but there's only one happier snuggle punk. So, so his happiness is changing on this sort of exponential ratio. And along the other side of this slide, you can see all the different sort of marks at which the snuggle punk gets happier. Um, and so it's our hope that this can sort of intuitively give people the understanding that um, the, the, the happiness that they're expressing in the artwork is not changing that much as they get closer to the end of the slider. Um, and you can see that, uh, just another example, um, the votes are distributed equally. So about a third of the votes here are given to three artworks and they're all getting a sort of neutral to positive um, outcome in terms of the, the snuggle punk's happiness. Um, so I'll pass it back to Ruth. So um, just to kind of cap this off. So culture stake will create a permanent communally owned data about what matters to people in the culture that happens in places. So around each festival or fair that we run, the data that is produced will belong to those localities and the artists and audiences and venues that created it. Um, so QV, like, I'm really glad you used the word expressive, Paula, in your introduction. So I think the thing that drew us to QV was an intuition just about the level of expressivity that it could lend to people's responses to art. And because aesthetic choices or preferences are often really nuanced um, and people feel very strongly about certain things, but they might not kind of uh, know in what kind of configuration their aesthetic preferences are felt. We really felt like this was a good match. And also that culture state through this playful interface will provide a very playful and appro approachable way for people to both express their nuanced preferences and get a kind of renewed sense of curiosity about what voting and sharing preferences might do for them. And Sarah, and you're it, going to... And in go. terms of the, the, the blockchain component, um, it may not have been clear up until this point in the presentation, um, but this is also a blockchain voting application. Um, and by using blockchain, um, we're demonstrating um, some of the possibilities of trusted data that is secure, um, but also transparent and permanent. Um, blockchains as a type of technical system, I think are good at a couple of things. Um, one of them is financial applications and another one is transparency. Um, so culture stake is giving people sort of an example of the ways that elections could be auditable to everyone publicly um, that we're not familiar with. Um, typically in elections, um, it's, it's, it's modeling um, permanent communally owned infrastructure um, in a cultural setting. Um, it's also uh, the, proce the process of voting on artworks that could be commissioned further is actually fundamentally a financial process too. Um, so by using a blockchain, we're opening ourselves up to some extensibility here once Culture Stake is actually funding um, further artworks. Um, projects like this build literacy bi-directionally, um, one in users of what voting could be and could look like, and also in mechanism designers about how these mechanisms can behave in the wild. Definitely. Wow, this is fascinating. I wish we had a few hours here because I could <laughs> talk uh, so much about this, but there's a lot more to be heard. Um, now, Next, we're going to be talking to Max, who has been uh, experimenting with blockchain also um, and quadratic voting and implementing it for the vote party in Germany. So Max, uh, I'd love for you to tell us about the specific pilot, but also I'm interested in hearing from you if you are kind of pitching this idea out there, what are some types of arenas in which you think that quadratic voting uh, makes sense and where and what types of situations or what groups are being uh, responsive to it? Yes. Um, hi <laughs> to everyone. I'm, I'm Max. I'm part of the Aura. I think I can answer those uh, questions during my presentation. Um, definitely. And um, before I get started, um, I want to show you this piece of art from Robert McCall, because um, as you, Paula, put it in the beginning, um, we're really thinking of this positive mindset and future that uh, may be ahead of us, you know, maybe using also technology to do this. And uh, this uh, piece of art is capturing it quite well. And we're seeing a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us that is um, in, or in the way to, to reach this uh, goal. 
And the biggest challenge that we are seeing here at Yora is um, for humanity in general is coordination. So we put uh, our purpose in this direction to empower civil society to take the next evolutionary step of social and economic coordination. And we believe that decentral organization is um, a key factor here. So what we're doing is we basically build organization solutions for self-managed and non-hierarchical communities. That means we want to leave those traditional top-down uh, decision-making, central hierarchies, uh, patterns, and um, go to a new movement that we see um, develop and flourish in the recent times. It's about organic collaboration. It's about decentral decision-making. It's about autonomy of, of peers, of people. It's uh, also about responsiveness, which is really important in this super complex world that uh, we are facing. And we're seeing happening this on many levels, starting from partnerships to crews to organization to bigger communities, even to global coordination and um, you know, back to the unknown crowd that is out there. And we have been experimenting on some of these levels, um, starting with the Critic Voting app that we've developed, but also uh, Rosebud Fund, which is a collaborative funding tool for film producers who want to pool in money. Uh, Keatsdow, which is um, a neighborhood help a platform for tool sharing, uh, where blockchain is also really interesting to, um, to use. Then we uh, are working on a teal garden, which is a knowledge sharing uh, community and platform to to um, and get uh, self managed teams and organizations on there to share their methods and practices to overcome a lot of challenges that they are facing as a, as a self managed organization. But uh, we want to jump into critical voting, of course. And uh, last year we had the chance um, with the vote party. Uh, it's a European movement. It's uh, quite active to um, do quadratic voting on their manifesto topics and their policies that they're having. And we had a lot of active voters, a lot of transactions going on. We used a layer two on Ethereum solution for it. And uh, what was really interesting here, and uh, the other said it as well, that identity solution is needed uh, to prevent any civil attacks. And we used an on-ramp through a QR code, which was on the voter card itself, meaning every eligible voter got a voter card um, before they entered the venue and there was a private key in the form of a QR code on it and everybody was allowed to like, um, scan their own QR code and then vote uh, quadratically on those topics. Um, the results are really astonishing for the party itself and for us, of course. Um, it allowed a way new insight um, for them to identify, identify strong commonalities that the people are having. Um, starting here with the a new union and uh, education, for instance, or sustainability. And we can also see this distribution, you know, that is happening here where people are more interested and or less interest, interested. And uh, what we also found interesting, not in this particular experiment, but with other experiments, when we use also negative votes, meaning minus one, two, three, and four, and we see people are voting a lot on negative votes and people are voting on high positive votes, we can identify friction points that uh, are maybe needed to be addressed through mediation or through a discussion, open discussion. And as put it before, the strong minority and making strong preferences of the minority here um, is also um, easily uh, seen. This blue line is indicating people who used over one third of their voting power just on one single um, subject. And for the party itself, it's now easy to maybe form working groups um, to uh, get this topic maybe stronger attention. And if it's, if it's a transparent vote, people can even form themselves into groups and uh, make this happen. And our recent, um, oops, our recent experiment was uh, with the Eve Turin 2020 hackathon uh, back in April. And um, the people were allowed to vote, a democratic vote on the submitted projects to uh, distribute all the prize money to, to the to the, yeah, to the to the folk, and um, the interesting update we did here through Corona and uh, through non-physical, you know, presence to uh, be sure that people um, are there is we did an on-ramp through uh, a faucet, an interface uh, that checks um, digital tickets. In this case, it was an NFT ticket, and um, when people, you know, signed the message uh, saying, "Okay, I own this ticket through a Web3 wallet." Um, a QR code popped up or a link and people could follow this uh, QR code or scan it 
and um, they got the voice credits immediately in Vinted. So we got this, um, yeah, this um, identity solution solved in this particular uh, way in this way. And uh, here also we had minority voices shared really clearly. Um, this, for instance, is a strong minority outbound. I mean, the others had the chance to do these um, voting schemes as well. Um, but we also see here, uh, yeah, <laughs> strong preferences. Uh, the key takeaways in general from um, Kilfreddy voting that we had um, were mentioned earlier, strong identity, education is key, um, telling people what is quadratic voting, you know, going, going this one step further. Um, but it's also not only a digital solution, it needs to emphasize the concept, context around it, meaning the information that debates are happening around certain proposals or certain mixes. And it needs to be simple. I think um, um, the other example showed easily with this uh, little, um, yeah, uh, animal, I don't know how to tell, I forgot the name. Uh, it was super a nice way to, to show it. We did a way, way more simpler way with, with the drag, uh, dragging um, interface, nothing, nothing special here, but it's good to learn. Um, yeah, this is our team um, at Diora, but uh, we are not alone, basically. We are part of a self-managed community of um, Web 3.0 crews who are working on their own projects, on their own uh, yeah, crew infrastructure. Uh, Diora itself is building um, a lot of um, yeah, self-managed infrastructure for the community in itself because we're all based on blockchain. So there's a lot of possibilities. And um, we use quadratic voting for our own. Since uh, we are a community, we need um, some kind of commonality in the direction of our purpose. So um, quadratic voting helped us just, um, I think, three weeks ago to really identify more those topics that people are interested in and want to go forward to. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, if you guys are a self-managed team or want to go more, you can always reach out to us. And yeah, thanks for your attention. Can I stop? Here? Thank you for sharing that, uh, Max. These are, you know, fascinating results, and it goes to show kind of the nuance and the granularity that quadratic voting offers uh, when we use it for voting. Um, Ben is going to be speaking to us today about how Colorado is going to use quadratic voting for the executive branch. But before that, I'd just like to uh, make an introduction to, to his and step out of my moderator uh, role and move into presenter for a minute to talk about uh, the first implementation of quadratic voting in Colorado. This is going to be the second. so. That is already a very, very positive signal to us. It means that, you know, we had good results. And the first one we helped implement with Democracy Earth and Radical Exchange. And it was for the legislative branch. So what we did there was um, there were around 100 bills that legislators had to prioritize. They had this budget and they had to decide which of the, of the bills were uh, going to be funded first. And the issue there was that they, many of those, most of the of those legislators were also authors of those bills. So it was very, um, you know, you could assume that they would vote out of self-interest and then the result wouldn't be kind of very informative of what they should be prioritizing as a collective. So the year before they tried quadratic voting, they were trying to tackle this issue and they, gave 15 tokens for every legislator so that they could distribute around 15, the 15 top answers. And just so you see how difficult it is uh, to, to get to prioritize in a group, they didn't get a good signal and they had a few bills on the top and then most of them were kind of this blob where there wasn't a clear order between them. They have had roughly the same amount of votes. And with quadratic voting the following year, this was done in 2019, they actually got this uh, very kind of granular result. So I'll just show this to you guys uh, very quickly. Um, so this was the app that was used. They could vote here and then uh, they would see their budget moving on this side. And then um, these are the results. So 
you can see here that there's a very organic curve and there were a little over a hundred bills, only five of them did not get any votes. And we could see this with quadratic voting that you can prioritize a very long tail of items and get a very, very precise signal. So we were mind blown by that um, as quadratic voting nerds. We thought this was a very cool result. And um, Ben, I'd love you if you have any comments on that, uh, how did that go? moving uh, from there. And then if you can tell us uh, how, how is the state of Colorado looking into using quadratic voting uh, beyond that uh, and you know, really taking it uh, from being just this theory to something that is actually employed in, in government. Awesome, thank you, Paula. Um, last year's experiment was very successful and very effective. Um, the world looked a lot different last year than it does this year. Uh, and so as the legislature was uh, sitting around and making some, uh, some choices about where they wanted to spend those marginal dollars, um, I think you said it very well in the beginning, it was a, the best way for them to express themselves. Um, and this tool allowed them to express themselves in a way that uh, traditional voting structures don't allow. Um, we saw that in the executive branch and got really excited about it. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with um, a whole bunch of public servants in a whole bunch of different agencies. And so we have, uh, in the state of Colorado, we have about 32,000 uh, dedicated public servants working every day to, to deliver real services to, to the people of Colorado. And um, the structures are, are ingrained. It's, very, it's a very formal structure. We have these bureaus and these departments and they have specific um, structures in mind and, and there's a hierarchy that's very similar to what Max was talking about. And it doesn't always lead to the best outcomes and um, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of our top priorities uh, for Governor Polis is early childhood education. Um, we know that this is something that just um, reaps return on investment in a way that most policy issues don't in our society. We should be investing more money early on as much as possible. Um, but to accomplish that, you know, the legislature says spend money on early childhood education and then it's uh, handed over to us to implement. Um, that means we need to be focusing on the children themselves, but it also means we need to be focusing on um, teachers, it means we need to be focusing on schools. And the, the structure of government means that that's three or four different departments, different bureaus that suddenly have to work together in an organic way to, to deliver real outcomes. And there's a lot of tiny decisions that are made in that very bureaucratic structure. You know, how you spend the marginal dollar here versus there um, and where you prioritize and when. And so we saw quadratic voting as a, an, an incredible opportunity for us to build a collaborative organic government as much as we can uh, and begin to get these bureaucrats who um, think very structured uh, in a way to, to kind of work together in a way that they, they're not used to. And so my job working in the governor's office is um, we have uh, several working groups that are organic and dynamic and they focus on outcomes. So instead of the, the traditional process oriented government work, um, we, we've tried to get people to focus at the end result, um, you know, the, the real kind of impact to people and how we're changing people's lives on a day to day basis. Um, and then we drive all of our decisions there. And so we, we ran a process this year. Uh, we, we just finished uh, last week, actually. So we don't even have the results yet, um, but the, the process helps run um, these organic groups, teams of people from across state government, from across departments, all focused in their subject matter expert, whether uh, it's facilities or workforce or employment or health or criminal justice. Um, we're, we're getting these subject matter experts to sit around together and to begin to talk about the trade-offs it takes to accomplish the outcomes with the outcomes in mind. Um, and so we've begun to use quadratic voting to, to do this because we know that the structure of government is not distributed fairly, it's not distributed evenly, and that um, the minorities within government, those um, tiny offices that don't get very much funding, are just as important as the, the big offices that get lots of funding. Um, and I think this year is particularly interesting because we're not in a position we were last year where we had $100 million to, to distribute across a number of bills. Uh, this year, we're looking at budget cuts of close to 20%. Um, and and it's, it's going to be very harmful and painful to a lot of people. 
And so as you start talking about the real trade-offs it takes to, to provide services and maintain the level of um, social outcomes that we hold ourselves accountable to, we need to decide where to spend our time. We need to decide where to spend our money. Uh, and if we're doing it appropriately, it's, a, it's in an organic structure and it's in a collaborative structure where bureaucrats from one agency can work with bureaucrats from another agency. And we found quadratic voting to be um, a fantastic tool that lets these public servants express themselves and lets groups convene themselves in an organic dynamic way focused on those outcomes. Um, and, and we started to get some agencies so excited about quadratic voting. They're now asking for the tools and the templates themselves. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I've been really lucky to work with Matt Pruitt and Paul Healy as part of the Radical Exchange Foundation. Uh, and, and they've built a template now that we can begin to distribute across state government. And so smaller teams all across um, our, our vast bureaucracy will begin to use these tools themselves and to make um, you know, distributed decisions in and amongst themselves in a, hopefully an organic and dynamic way. Wow. This is so interesting because we are usually thinking about how uh, this can help groups, uh, voices within a group to coalesce. But uh, what you're talking about here is having different groups within a government come together, which is also another big issue. So I'm really happy to be hearing about this uh, being used in that way. And I will be, I'm so curious to follow up on this and learn how did it go. Um, we have a few questions from the audience, but I would just like to, to hear from you. You know, one of the things about quadratic voting, which really came up in your explanation uh, now, Ben, is that it really brings us close. Every, every decision-making system is going to be a try to get a representation of reality, which by definition is going to be different from reality in so many ways. And, and it's going to fail at that. But quadratic voting is kind of moving a little closer to reality in trying to uh, represent how things actually work. So it brings kind of this richness of organic social interactions uh, to, to a voting system. So I'd love to hear from you. We're going through a very turbulent political time with a lot of needs for change that feel urgent, but at the same time, uh, we have a lot of disagreement, right, in our society about how things should be going on moving forward. So I'd love to hear from you all, uh, what are the ways in which these properties of quadratic voting can be relevant right now? And also thinking about something that Audrey Tang said on her presentation, she mentioned that one of the things that made it, that made the Taiwan civic tech movement and the Taiwan government so successful in using technologies is that they demonstrated um, how to come together and make decisions in their process, in, the, in their demonstrations. So their demonstrations were literal demonstrations of how government can be better. They were these movements, the umbrella movement was using civic tech to come uh, to decisions uh, among themselves. And with that kind of modeled to government how, how things could be better. So I'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on how quadratic voting can be relevant and helpful uh, today in the context that we that we find ourselves right now with the pandemic and with uh, lots of social change. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm lucky to work for an administration who uh, is very focused on these issues and we, we spend all our time doing this. Um, I was lucky enough to, to get the position I'm in right now about three days before Colorado received their first COVID response. Uh, and so it's, it's been a whirlwind of a, of a past three or four months. Um, the tools here help bring people together in a way that I think is unique. And it brings people together in a way that allows for distributed decision-making and the voice of the minority to shine through. Um, and, and we see this, I think now more than ever with some of the racial tensions we're seeing in America. Um, 
I, I'm lucky enough to work in a, in a state where we just passed some very sweeping legislation just yesterday. We signed a bill into law that implemented a lot of reforms and accountability on some of our law enforcement and police structures that um, I think we rose to, we, we, we found those solutions because of our collaborative nature, because we are willing to work as a group and as a team and listening to one another and, and hold up the voice of the minority. It's something we really pride ourselves on. Um, but we don't really have the, the quantitative tools to do that decision making, or we didn't until very recently. And so you can have that conversation and that collaboration, um, but when it actually comes to making that decision, to, to expressing yourself in that final say and passing legislation or not, or implementing the policy or not, um, there still was not a good tool. And, and if you think about the way democracy has been built over centuries and centuries, um, our thinking has evolved over time, and yet our tools have not always evolved over time. The, the voting systems that we used uh, in, in antique times, ancient times, is still the same uh, tools that we were using up until very recently. And so um, I, I think it's time that these kinds of tools like quadratic voting can be used to hold up the voice of the minority so that we can listen and implement um, change and accountability uh, in, in ways that's just as nuanced as the way we feel. Um, and, and that's, I think, a really important tool for democracy and, and hopefully empowers people to get more engaged over time. Wonderful. Um, so I made a very, <laughs> a very strict promise to keep this on time, to wrap it up on time. But I see that there are many more uh, questions coming up from the audience. So I would love if each of you could quickly uh, let people know how, how they could reach out or learn more about your work um, and ask questions if they have. And also, uh, if you'd be willing to share lessons learned uh, from your own implementations to help other people uh, implement this, how, how could they access that? Um, maybe start on my end. So everybody can visit uh, diora.earth and um, or just write me an email, max.diora.earth. It's uh, all open source. Um, everybody can contact us. We can guide you through, walk you through how we implement it, uh, maybe the faucet, how we did the quadratic voting app and everything. And if everybody has, anybody has any question or want to philosophize more, maybe, um, more than welcome to reach out uh, on our end. Yeah, uh, you can find uh, Culture Stake on the Furtherfield website. So you can just uh, search for furtherfield.org and uh, you'll find Culture Stake as one of the projects on there. And you can DM us on Twitter and we will happily talk to you about any of the things that we've discussed. Sarah, would you like to say anything about uh, GitHub? Do you want um, to, I mean, Sure, yeah, that could be fun. Um, all of the culture stake work is all um, open source on GitHub under an organization called Lazarus Labs. Um, if anyone is interested to, to look there. Uh, you can find us on, on the web, colorado.gov, uh, or you know I'm on Twitter and, and we work closely with the Radical Exchange Foundation. So hopefully our future quadratic voting work will be uh, shared, shared uh, mutually uh, through both organizations. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming here, joining us, sharing uh, your experiences. Thank you for also uh, being open to try this out in your communities. I feel like this is one of the uh, most important uh, types of work we, we, you know, as someone who has been exploring kind of the intersection of democracy and technology, I definitely feel like one of the most important things that we can do right now is we have so much technology, we have so many interesting tools but we need to employ them and it's difficult. It's difficult to get people to accept, to try new things. So you are all pioneering, we are all pioneering, and this is very much needed work. So thank you so much. And I hope that if you're listening to this, you were inspired to try this out in your community as well. <laughs>